Hi, Linton here, and this is Sketch and Tell, and this is part of my series called Colours of Australia. And even though I'm in a very cold place in lockdown in Victoria, I'm going to uh, use my imagination and hopefully together we can go to a very special place. And I'm going to uh, do a painting and then just share some thoughts about this particular painting. One of the privileges that I have, <clears throat> that I take whenever the opportunity uh, is there, is to be invited out to remote and rural places. And this is, um, it's a generic scene, but it is uh, very similar to some of the uh, sheep and cattle stations that I get invited to, to go out and stay at while I work in the, in the communities. And this is uh, in central Queensland, which is again where I'd like to be right now. The, People I love because they, they have hearts of gold. They are down to earth and, and totally generous. But it's also just that opportunity to, to get away from, from my normal suburban life, city life, and to not only experience something different, but to, to think more deeply about my life. And one of the ways I do that is I get up early in the morning and I like to just, before sunrise, to go for a walk down to the front gate. Now, when we talk about front gates on these sheep and cattle stations, we're not talking a few hundred metres, so often they're kilometres away. But to just walk down in the quietness and stillness of the early morning, along that dirt uh, track, uh, that road that leads into the station, I like to use that time to centre myself and to think about what it is that I'm going to 
bring to this day and how I can make a, a small difference in the community that I, I find myself in. As I do this, I also, uh, because there's no distractions, there's no traffic or anything else, uh, maybe a few sheep or cows, but um, I like to look up into the sky and to see the sky in a way I cannot see in the suburbs. And in those uh, wide open spaces, in the darkness of the, the, the morning night, you just see the sky alive in brilliance, in the uh, mass of stars that are there. And particularly the Milky Way, which I often call the, uh, the Milky Spray. It's like somebody got a big can and just sprayed across the, the night sky. This is my opportunity to be a little bit, to uh, tap into my uh, megalomania and to, for a moment, be a star maker. There's no way I can do justice to the starry night and the Milky Way as you see it in the outback, but uh, I'll, I'll give a representation. So we'll um, just uh, cover the sky in uh, brilliant stars and throw them over there, I'll throw some over here, up there. As I look up into that starry night, I know that uh, from what I've read that you, with the naked eye you can probably only count a few thousand stars. But with um, telescopes, uh, they estimate that in our Milky Way, which we're sort of off, off center from it, we're out on the, one of the spirals on the outer, but our, our little uh, galaxy, our little uh, uh, planet and sun solar system. But in the Milky Way, we, we are looking at an immense number of uh, stars, up to 200 billion stars. And you just have to let that sink in. And you go, wow. But that's not all that's up there. I am often um, mind thinking of the space probes that have been launched and just keep traveling and are still traveling in the far reaches of our, of our space, of our universe, sending back images that uh, give us an insight of what is beyond the reach of our own radio uh, telescopes. And one of those uh, space probes was um, Voyager 1, I think it is, launched in 1977, still traveling. And I can remember when it got to the end, the edge of our own Milky Way galaxy. And it was starting to beam back images of galaxies beyond our view. And one of those was the Sombrero Galaxy, shaped like a sombrero. And they estimate that from those images, we are probably looking at 800 billion stars. And these two galaxies that I've just mentioned, the Milky Way and the Sombrero, aren't the only ones. There are millions of other galaxies. And each one of the, those little pinpricks of light that I'm looking at represent a sun. And yet the distances are so vast between each one we measure them in light years. And again, as I walk down this uh, track, I uh, measure myself in the scheme of things to what I'm looking at. And at times it is, it is a healthy exercise just to remember that I am so small and what I'm looking at is so big, so wondrous, so amazing. And also to remember that my, my life is just one fleeting blink of an eye in, in what has unfolded and what is still unfolding. But I can quickly then slip into an unhealthy perspective, and that is to think, well, who am I? I'm just one little speck on this one little mud planet that uh, revolves around one minor star in a, a universe of billions and trillions of other stars. Who am I and what's this all about? But it's at that point that I need to shift my gaze away from myself and to another reference point. And this is where I do admire people who can look up into the night sky and start to uh, work out and point out the different 
uh, groupings of stars, the constellations, and they can say, well, there's Orion, and there's the Big Dipper, and there's Virgo, and there's Leo, Scorpio, the, uh, the Big Bear, and all the others. I kind of look up and go, I can't see it, but I, I trust you. But there is one that I can always find. I can even see it here in Melbourne at night. And that's the one I look for. And I'm going to put it up in, in a much bigger scale than what it normally is, but just so we can have it as, as a visual reference. And it consists of uh, four stars, top, bottom, side, side, and a little fifth one, which is actually a, a, a group of uh, stars if you look through a telescope. But this is, of course, called the Crux. To us, we call it the Southern Crux or the Southern Cross. And as I look at the Southern Cross, I, I kind of let it become, as I said, my reference point and also shape my thoughts about what I'm looking at and also where do I fit into this, into this uh, incredible world that I find myself in. I think, first of all, about its, its history. And the Southern Cross was not always to be seen here in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, 2,000 years ago, if you were in the Middle East, you would have seen the Southern Cross. It wasn't called that then, but that cluster of stars would have been sitting low on the horizon. And it was a significant uh, cluster. And then it disappeared because all constellations are moving. And it slipped down below that horizon line. And it took a long time before intrepid sailors and adventurers and explorers who moved down into the southern hemisphere rediscovered it. And in a world where there were uh, very limited navigational uh, tools that we rely on today, they, they relied on the stars. And the Southern Cross was one of those significant guiding lights. And I just want to throw out a little bit of trivia, if you can remember back to your scouting days, um, if you find yourself out in the bush and you haven't got GPS or other ways of navigating, you can still look to the Southern Cross and you can work out pretty much where the points of the compass are. And there are uh, two main ways to do that, but I'll uh, just do the, the main one and that is to go from the top to the bottom and you go down about two and a half lengths and then drop straight down to the horizon line and that gives you pretty much where south lies and then you can work out the rest of the points. And so as I look at the Southern Cross I'm reminded that it was it was significant as a navigational guide to a lot of people but it also is a significant symbol to a lot of other people who are on a soul journey because it is the crux, the cross, the Latin cross and in history, the cross has become symbolic of a person who was nailed to that cross 2,000 years ago. And I'm referring to Jesus. And the cross, uh, even if you look at its uh, formation, it really is a way of thinking, first of all, about his passion, his death. The top star is the crown of thorns, the wound in the head. The two side stars, the wounds in the hands. The bottom star, the nail through the feet, the wound there, and this little star over here, or cluster of stars, the spear wound into the side. But it's uh, more than that as I look at it that I want to uh, think about, not so much um, look at it in the traditional way, but for me, thinking about Jesus and what he brought to us and what he fleshed out in his life and in his teaching and in his death and his resurrection. There is something special and unique. And I again remindful of one of those probes that uh, is still shooting out into outer space and it was called the um, New Horizons, launched up in 2006. And it was sent to photograph our most distant planet in our solar system, Pluto. And I can remember when it was starting to beam back those first images of what little Pluto looked like. I can see, I can remember hearing the, the joys of exclamation, the, the, the uh, wows and the, uh, the excitement and the faces uh, of the, the people who are in the control center. Because they, as they were looking at those first images, they realized that what they had imagined Pluto to be like was nothing like the reality. All we had were artists' impressions of what Pluto might look like. 
But when I looked at it, I said, it is just so much more. It is the textures, the color, and what it's promising. Because they even now say that perhaps under the crust of Pluto, there's evidence of a whole ocean, a frozen ocean of water. But as I thought about that, I thought that is very much how I view the coming of Jesus, the presence of Jesus. Because like that probe, Jesus brought a real image of what God is like and is like for each one of us. Because if we are honest with ourselves, most of us kind of use our imagination and we shape our image of God based on our experiences, based on our upbringing, based on our cultural um, uh, experience, uh, perhaps our religious experience. And we sort of shape our views of God, which always need to be tested, not just by our own journey in life, but need to be tested by what Jesus brought. And Jesus, for those who knew him, they initially gave him a title, which I think was very significant. They said, this is Emmanuel. And one of the things that Jesus brought was that as we look up into the expanse of the universe, God is not someone who's stuck way out there on the backside of Pluto or beyond, who's far removed from our daily existence and our issues and our problems and our anxieties. But that God, yes, is the one who birthed this amazing universe, who holds it together, who is even bigger than what we are looking at, but is also as close to us as our breath and our heartbeat. Emmanuel, God with us. And as people spent time with Jesus, as they intuitively sensed who this person could be, that yes, fully human, but also bringing us a fleshed out uh, experience of God with us and what it's like. And it was a very different image to what they had grown up with and what they were being taught by their religious institutions. And there are two words which I have been commonly used, they're kind of God words, to describe their, their sense of what Jesus was bringing to change not God's views about us and God's mind about us, but to change our views and imagination to who God is, the one who is with us. And those two words are mercy and grace. But I'm going to look at them in a, a different way. And please excuse me, to, I'm going to have a little bit of fun here, but nonetheless, uh, it might be helpful. Now, some of you might know what a star sort of map looks like. I'm going to uh, put up my own star map here. And I'm going to draw two constellations, two images of what my image of God often was as I was growing up and it still lurks there within me and I've got to constantly uh, compare it to what Jesus brought. And the first one is this and I'm going to join up some stars over here. So we'll join up these up the top here. Let me just put a, uh, kind of a big star there across here. Do a bit of a loop there. Come down, join this one up here. Do a little double dip. Come over here. And join up over there, and then we'll come over, we'll just circle these stars here. Join up these ones over here, come across. Just uh, put on some uh, bottom appendages there, and just uh, do the most important part of the, the constellation here. And hopefully you can see in a fun way I've drawn uh, an, uh, an enforcing officer, a, a, a cop, a police person. And this is kind of how I thought God, if God was around, what God was like. A huge celestial enforcer of the moral code and rules. That's all God was interested in. And to dish out fines and punishments if I transgressed and to have some kind of um, database where all my uh, transgressions were being numbered and kept in store to be held against me. And so I feared that kind of image and I thought, well, what's the point of even trying to get do business with that kind of God? 
because I knew deep down, as if all of us are, are honest with ourselves, we fall far short of whatever code we might put on ourselves, uh, irrespective of the others that people try to place on us. But Jesus, when you see his life, first of all, he was known. It was, a, it was actually used as a, as a bit of an uh, insult from the religious institutions against him. They said, you're the friend of sinners. Just think about that. He was the friend of those who, in the eyes of the religious community and institutions, said they had fallen far short of how they should be living their lives. To the broken, to those filled with shame, to those who were considered outcasts, to those who were the misfits, Jesus loved their company. He spent time with them. He genuinely did. He didn't pretend. He had meals and, and celebrations with them. And he let them know that this is how God felt towards them. And they intuitively knew this. And it was revolutionary to them. That they were included in God's all-embracing love. Not just a few, an elite few, but all. No matter how far we might consider ourselves, using the analogy, a fallen star. And when I think about this, I also think of, as I look at the cross, the Southern Cross, that he then went to the ultimate demonstration of how far God was willing to go to put things right between us. And as Jesus was nailed to that cross, somehow, I don't understand it, it is the ultimate mystery, as is the mystery of evil and good and how the two can be reconciled, especially in my life. But somehow Jesus took all of the, the evil, the injustice, the failures, the shame, the guilt, the brokenness, not just of those around me, but within myself. And as he hung there, he hung in solidarity with all of us. And he embraced it without retaliating, without holding it against us, without seeking vengeance and dishing out punishment. And somehow in that embrace, he was able to, in his incredible love that he brought to us, that found its source, that finds its source in God, He transformed it. And so what we find in our encounter with God is not a cop, but someone who loves us no matter what. And someone who's able to heal and forgive and restore and transform us from the inside out. I'm reminded of a story here now. Please, I, I again have forgotten uh, a lot of the details and I'm even not sure whether it's, it's true or not but the the meaning of it is, is is really good and it is about a young girl who was over in the Philippines just a village girl who had a reputation of being able to talk directly with Jesus and people would flock to her to ask her to mediate on their behalf and word got back to the to the Catholic Church in the uh, uh, Manila particularly and the a uh, cardinal there was asked to, uh, to check her out, which, which is, a, you need to do this. If people make claims about what they can do, it's, it's always good to check it, check it out. And so this girl was brought into the office, the big lush office of this cardinal, and they talked and he inquired. And then he finally said, look, there's only one way to really put this to the test. Are you willing, he said, over the weekend to do this? He said, I'm going to hold mass on Saturday and I'm going to actually confess my sins to God, to Jesus. Are you willing to ask Jesus on the weekend what my sins were that I am confessing and to tell me on Monday what they were? And the girl said, I will ask him. And so the weekend passed and they met up again on the Monday and the Cardinal eagerly sort of leaned forward in his chair and he says, well, he said, did you ask Jesus? And the girl said, yes, I did. What did he say? Now, whether the girl was just a very, very smart cookie, or whether she was just saying it as it was, she looked him in the eye and she said, I asked him what you had confessed, and he replied that he had forgotten. And Jesus embodied that. He, that is what I love about this person called Jesus, whom I look at as I think about the Southern Cross. The other group of stars is uh, over here, and we'll just start to join them up. 
and we'll just come around with a few little wiggly lines over here and here down there and join those up we'll put around here and Hopefully you can recognise the Grinch. The Grinch who stole Christmas. I love that story. And Dr. Zeus. And Grinch, of course, of that, that mean, nasty, tight-fisted creature with, with no heart or a heart that was so small and shriveled up. He had no joy. He, did, he hated Christmas because of all the joy and the celebration that it brought to Whoville down at the bottom of his mountain. And he even went out of his way to destroy Christmas and to steal Christmas and to take the joy out of it. No empathy, no compassion until he met that little girl Mary who from Whoville who in her love and simple generous gift changed his heart and he brought Christmas back. But I used to think that that's, that's, that's a picture of what God is like. He's just a big Grinch. There's no joy in having a relationship with God. He takes it away. He makes your life miserable. He makes you do things you don't want to do or go to places you don't want to do. He, he makes everyone else hate you. He, he doesn't want you to enjoy life in all of its fullness, but just to keep it really narrow and, and, and boring. I could go on. There's different ways of describing this. But it's interesting that Again, those people who knew Jesus, who flocked to him, who ate with him, the thing that constantly came out as a response was joy. There was joy and there was celebration and transformation as a result that this is what God is like. And one of the heartfelt experiences and this is not just for the, our inner life, but also our outer life, is that God is not someone who is mean and tight-fisted like the Scrooge, but someone who is open-handed and generous. Someone who is compassionate, who knows what our needs are and wants to meet those needs, not just dish out little bits, but generously overflowing more than we can experience, uh, do for ourselves. I'm reminded, as I think about this, of a place back up on the Gold Coast that I spent a couple of years working at. It was a, a project for homeless youth, where we had a number of homes providing short-term accommodation and trying to help them to get their life back on track and to find work for them. But every year, towards Christmas, a group of retired police men and women who had spent the whole year fundraising would come to us and they would say we have enough money here for you to we want to give you something special on on this particular day there's going to be a bus turning up we want you just to hop on the bus and to enjoy this day on our behalf and they would take us usually to dream world one of the big theme parks there and we would go in all expenses paid and we would find at lunchtime tables just groaning in food that we can enjoy ourselves eating. We were allowed to go to shops and buy some uh, souvenirs, all expenses paid. It was a great day. But there was always, always, there was one or two people in our homes when we told them that this is going to happen. They would say, I don't believe that. They're cops. I hate them. They hate me. It's a, tr it's a setup. I'm just going to be disappointed again. And no matter how much we try to persuade them, they refuse to hop on that bus and experience it for themselves. And always one of us would have to stay back and to uh, look after them while the rest went off to find that it was real. And for me, that is, has been and still is my experience.
that when you let go of your own small things that you are holding on to, to give you life, to give you security and joy and think that if you open up to God, He's going to not only take that away, but everything else. It's quite the opposite. Jesus is the one who expanded our view of God's character and nature who is with each one of us. And it is a great journey to go on. And also, as I look at those, the Southern Cross, I say to myself, as I am letting that image that Jesus brought of God shape my thinking and my heart, and I want to embrace it, I want it to inspire me, to change me, but I also want to pass it on. I want to be a, a small light in the world that I find myself in, even if it is a very small part of the world, small part of the universe. I want to be someone who is not just receiving mercy and grace from God, but I want to pass that on to those around me. As I finish this picture, have a colourful day.